So please, give a big round of applause to Graham Downing. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. No? Yes? Good. Okay, so this presentation will be relatively short, which you'll be glad of, as you've just had your, your, your meal. Uh, and then, allegedly, we're going to go straight through to the second one. So, a couple of quotes for you there. St. Bernard, and Virgil's Enid, and roughly translated, the road to hell is paved with good intention. <laughs> now, okay, at the risk of getting stoned, <laughs> I'm not going to make any comment about this man other than the road to hell is paved by profiteering, it's paved by psychopaths, and it is paved with good intention. I can't tell you which bit is which with this guy, I have no idea. I don't know him, I don't know him personally. But what I will suggest is this, is that if you imagine you're going to go for a, you're going to go and take a trip on a boat, okay, and you get a boat but you don't quite get the safety equipment right, and you don't really do the course you should have done, and maybe you didn't change the batteries on the weather stuff in, it, in the boat, and eventually you hit the perfect storm. And in other words, your intentions were good, but you didn't really do your homework properly. And I think this applies to this man. I'm going to take that road. I do understand there's another narrative with this man, okay? Now, he said, we're a bit vulnerable right now. It's something that spread very quickly, like, say, a flu that was quite fatal, and that would be a tragedy. And new approaches should allow us to reduce this risk a lot. There's a lot of discussion right now about how, we, we, how do we respond in an emergency and how do we make sure that the regulatory and the liability organisational boundaries don't slow us down. So what he's talking about is breaking down all the national boundaries and then him and his mates centrally dictating what vaccinations and, and how you should be medicated, okay? And that's not a good idea. And he spoke, at, I think it was Davos or something, he said, bioterrorism damage could be very huge if it happens, Bill Gates warns. Look at his left shoulder. I think... Uh, an epidemic, either naturally caused or intentionally caused, is the most likely thing to cause, say, 10 million excess deaths. Caused is the most likely thing to cause, say, 10 million excess deaths. Caused is the most likely thing to cause, say, 10 million excess deaths. Do you see his shoulder? Yeah. Do you know what that means? Well, in certain contexts, it can mean you're not quite committed to what you're saying, okay? And there might be another thing that's going to happen that might cause 10 million deaths. Uh, and that it's pretty surprising how little preparedness there is for it. Now, it's tricky because this is a global problem, so this is a global problem, so, you know, how do countries work together, which countries should put up what resources. Right, so it's a global problem, yeah? And actually, I think already at the moment, I think in the States, they're, they're putting forward legislation that if you aren't vaccinated outside of their borders, then you're a threat to their national security. So you can see how the wording goes and how it changes, and I haven't really got time to get into all of that. Okay, one more thing on him. Uh, we haven't had a, a super good response. So the paradigmatic examples are uh, smallpox for an intentionally caused thing, that there was a simulation called Dark Winter that didn't come out very well, uh, i.e. smallpox scored one and humanity scored zero. Uh, okay, so who's scared of smallpox? I dealt with this in another lecture, and this is uh, Dr. Mack, and he gave evidence um, uh, as an expert, as probably the world's expert in smallpox. And effectively what he said was, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, if someone coughed in his face with smallpox, I mean, prior to that, he, if he was going to intimately work with people with smallpox, he'd probably get vaccinated. But he pretty much said, look, it's not a problem. You know, it's, it's, even if it was to be introduced by terrorists, it's not going to take hold. And what he also said was, pretty much intimate, vaccination never got rid of smallpox. You know, it was raising economic standards, it was um, plumbing, it was uh, hygiene, proper nutrition, and the whole nine yards. So he's the expert. So we can discount the scaremongering about smallpox. Flu epidemics, where, you know, we always talk about the potential recurrence of a 1917-like uh, Spanish flu problem. There's only one problem with that. Do you know what it is? It was 1918. So he's the expert telling everybody about it. He can't even get the date right. Okay? Now, obviously, many, many millions died uh, during that epidemic. Now, I'm going to talk about this in a second. But Microsoft can really tell us about flu, can't we? We can really trust them, yeah?
That's the head of Microsoft. <laughs> I'd buy a computer off him. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, they want to fix Windows 10 for crying out loud before they, you know, tell us about pandemics. So we're going to jump straight into um, what we're going to talk about. So pneumonia, pneumococcal disease causes all sorts of things from meningitis to sinus infections to ear infections and pneumonia is not nice because it can kill you. Now, looks like a very confusing chart, but it isn't. If I can move around, so you've got reported cases here, okay, pneumonia, and you've got weeks in the year. There's not 53 weeks in the year, just, just the way they write it. All right, and then these graphs here, so if you used to ignore all the top ones and just look at that green line, it's saying the cases that are reported, okay, over these weeks for this year. And then the next line is the next year, okay, so that's the way you see it. And there's a couple of instances where they're vaccinated. Now, I've looked at this data and I've, I'm worried about it. And I'll tell you why. There's a break. Oh, okay, well, I'll tell you why in a second. So, first off, one of the problems is, is when you vaccinate for something, it can cause a problem because it can select for the strains that you don't vaccinate for. And so you vaccinate for one or two strains and then five or ten other strains perk up and they can tend to be a lot more infectious and more dangerous. So you're kind of chasing yourself all the time trying to clear an infection. Um, and this is what they suggest here. Now there's also published this year a study says, well, that kind of theory we had is a bit old. We've got another idea. What we actually think happens is when you vaccinate to get rid of something, what you actually do is you genetically change the other strains. So what you're doing is you're weaponizing those other strains. You're making them f they're much more transmissible and much more virulent. And this is what you see. So you can never, it's like trying to grab water. You're just never going to be successful. Now, coming back to this graph here, um, and this is UK data, and I'm showing this is, uh, uh, this is uh, under two years of age, talking about pneumococcal disease. Uh, now, if you look here, I'll show you. Can you see that break in the, in the graph there? It jumps a bit. I'll go back. I'll do it again. Can you see it? About here. Okay, it breaks. Now, it's interesting. Well, why would it do that? Why would it suddenly jump and the cases really start to kick off? Well, somebody else was vaccinated there in 2013. They went into the schools and they started, and they started to put the, the spray up the kid's nose for flu. Do you remember that? Okay. And I've been noticing year on year as they're starting to increase this, you see more and more people ill and they just can't get rid of this illness. And it comes and goes and they feel rotten and horrible. And these people aren't necessarily being vaccinated. They're just, once they start bringing this stuff in, you see more and more people getting ill. Now, if you look at, uh, this is over, this is from two to four years. Look at the size of the break there. Can you see it? Go back again. Oh no, I'll put an arrow in there, you can see. It's massive. <laughs> okay, and once again, this is the year they brought in that other vaccine. So now, you know, other scientists and people can look at this and pull this apart and argue about it. I'm quite happy for that. But for me, I'm seeing a change and I'm seeing a change which appears to coincide with another vaccine coming in. Well, why would that be? Well, you don't have to read all of that. This was a study looking um, at using uh, live attenuated um, viruses that, that go up the nose. And it's the same one. And they said, look, here we show that when they vaccinate you with this stuff, the stuff they're pulling up your kid's nose in schools, it primes the upper respiratory tract for increased bacterial growth of the very thing that causes those infections, the streptococcus, okay? In a manner nearly identical that to seen following the wild type influenza virus infection. So what you're doing is you're increasing the bacteria that causes those kind of pneumonia and those kind of horrible diseases. Now, that's quite a coincidence. Now, well, why is that important? Why is the 1918, not 1917, Mr. Gates, flu important? Because we were told the truth about it, but it didn't really get out. The CDC published a study, and they looked at this, and what they said was, actually, it wasn't the flu that killed people. What the, the flu is a self-limiting disease. It lasts a few days, and that was it. What it. But the flu allowed these colonizing bacteria to grow, and it was them that killed the, that killed the patients. Okay, so what you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be mimicking that. All right, and they call it a sequential infection hypothesis, and they say it's consistent with that uh, pandemic, and they say contemporaneous experts, uh, expert opinion and current knowledge and blah, 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 all agree with that. So we go back to this. This is the vaccine they're giving to your children. And what it does, it almost mimics the very same thing that happened 
for the 1918 Spanish flu. Now, the degree to which it's doing that, the extent, well, they're going to have to test it and find out, but no one's looking at this. So let's look at these again. And as you can see, they're vaccinating, but year on year, more people, more kids, are becoming infected. And as you can see, the jump. Once again, it's when they introduced that vaccine, okay? And once again, it's a big jump, you can see it there. And what's happening, I think, <coughs> excuse me, is that this increase in bacterial carriage in the upper respiratory tract is what's causing this increase in pneumococcal disease. And these diseases are serious. They cause meningitis and pneumonia. And pneumonia will kill you dead, okay? And so will meningitis. Now, me, I need to come where you guys are so I can actually see what I'm saying. Now, this is a recent study. They've, they very rarely they do a vaccinated versus un unvaccinated. Now, this isn't an anti-vaccine. I'm not doing an anti-vaccine talk. It's not about it. I'm just looking at data. And they actually found that vaccinated kids, this is about the only study I've seen, which, which, which is, you know, although it's a small study, it's actually conducted well. And kids who are vaccinated end up, tend to get more pneumonia. Now, they typed the virus, and it was an H1N1 virus that caused the Spanish flu. Okay, so that's good, so we know that. Now, the next stage is, how do we cripple the immune system and spread the infection? And there's something called original antigenic sin. Now, you don't have to read all that writing, and you don't have to be a genius to understand this. I've got my pointer, and I'm going to use it. There you go. So imagine a bug comes into the immune system. It's got a particular signature. Well, the immune system will identify it. It will kind of work out what it is, and then it's ready for the next time that bug comes. If the bug comes again, or another bug that's similar but a little bit different, the immune system will kind of look at it. It's locked in to handle it in a particular way, but it won't be able to handle it. It just won't be able to do it. So that the bug can actually get past the system. It can get deep into you and cause you problems. And they call that original antigenic sin. So if you have a particular infection, the immune system sets up for it. It comes in again in a slightly different form or a slightly different strain. And then suddenly the immune system can't handle it and can't handle it well. Now the problem with that is if you vaccinate someone and you lock that person into responding in a particular way against a particular strain, if you then get exposed to a similar strain or a different one, suddenly you're vulnerable to get an infection. And this was actually, this was, there was a study on this. Oh, wrong one. And they found that people that had the seasonal flu, someone was talking to me about the flu vaccine, a seasonal flu vaccine, they were at increased risk of becoming significantly infected in a pandemic. So if you want someone to get ill and be at risk, serious risk, then what you need to do is vaccinate them annually. You know, now other people will disagree with this, but there's like four or five people that back this up. So, I'll try and read from here. So, what are we doing? We're spraying stuff up the kid's nose, which is, in, which is increasing this very bacteria that they suggest caused the Spanish uh, 1918 flu. We're vaccinating and selecting for other strains or weaponizing other strains. We're weakening the immune system so that if a pandemic comes in, you are going to be weak and you won't be able to defend yourself properly. Now, I'm going to go on to this. This is the actual uh, vaccine that you're using with the kids. And this is from the vaccine package insert and licensing information. And if you look across the top there, what you can see quite clearly, hopefully, is they don't really know how it works. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, people say, oh, you can't get infected. Who's heard that, that you can't be infected when they vaccinate you? It, it won't infect you. Well, it has to infect you in order to work. Okay, that's actually in the licensing package. So when they give you that vaccine, if it doesn't infect you, it's not going to work. Also from there, if you look, it says, um, up to day three, 50% of human subjects are actually infectious because they're discharging it, okay? And even at day seven, six percent of subjects are still infectious, and you'd need to wait at least ten days. So if someone's been vaccinated, you'd need to wait at least at least ten days that that person isn't a danger to you. It's the complete opposite of what you're told. Look at the site. Look at this. The you get what's called an influenza-like illness, and they reckon one in ten kids that are vaccinated is at risk of getting this, or one in eleven. Okay. And if you look at the symptoms, you tell me that that's almost identical to the flu, isn't it? Also, on top of that, you've got asthma, bronchitis wheezing, shortness of breath, fever, chills, okay, and those are some of the things you can get from the vaccine, and it's one in ten or greater, and another vaccine, it was one in five you could get um, abnormal events. Now, the estimated probability 
if you're acquiring a virus after close contact with a single child that's had that thing stuck up their nose, is about one in 50. I'd probably say it's greater than that. So if you've got a kid at school and everyone's been vaccinated, your kid's probably going to acquire that infection from them. And it's a genetically modified virus. We can talk about that. That's, I won't do that today, but that's obviously not, not nice. But just presenting to the GP, just what's your risk of getting an influenza-like illness presented to GP? It's only one in 375. So why would you want to put yourself at that risk com compared to that? When they asked Tom Jefferson, who's the lead of something called the Cochrane Review, you heard of the Cochrane Review? They're an independent body of scientists that are allegedly not bought and paid for by the drug companies. And they asked him, they said, look, you know, would, would, should I give my, my four and a half year old this, this vaccine? And he said, no. And I've mentioned this before, I think, at one of the AV events. He said, because look, there's significant evidence that there's reporting bias. That means lying. Okay, and you know, and that's a, that's a very you know, diplomatic way of saying it. And he says it's about marketing, not science. And they know this. And I've shown you this before. I won't get into detail about this. But if you read it, look, probably about 4% of medicine has got any strong evidence to support its use. And up to 90% or more of all the trials they use are rubbish. Okay, they're drug company, drug-based trials, and they're not good. You've seen this before, I've shown you this before, but it's worth showing you again quickly. This was a paper written and they looked at the UK and they looked at the regulatory authorities that oversee the protection of you and your children and what drugs you get. And they're saying, look, this paper says, look, you should be able to trust these people, okay? And, you know, they should disclose all the foreseeable risks and all the rest of it, all the vaccines. And that what they shouldn't do is just lie to you in order to get you vaccinated. And what they found was that's exactly what they were doing. Okay, and that is what they suggest. Now, the actual effectiveness of the vaccine there, when the Americans looked at it, was minus 23%. Well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but apparently, and you'll see all sorts of studies over here now, and they gerrymandered the statistics to show that it works. So Public Health England, which is charged with the looking after all this, if, I've used their own data. Look, if you look there when they introduced this vaccine, 2013, can you see the respiratory rate rates going up in schools? Yeah, it's going up everywhere, apart from this blip here, okay? And if you actually put, map that out, it's a lot, it's a bit, and I looked at this and said, well, it's not working. I don't understand why they keep doing this. Remember, the Americans sussed it out, they don't use it, but apparently we still do. So we've got a question there. We're selecting for pneumonia, pneumococcal disease, by vaccinating for it. We're increasing the very bacteria in the nasal, uh, well, in the upper respiratory tract of kids via a different vaccine. And that has also been shown linked to the Spanish 18 flu. The seasonal vaccines they give make you susceptible to a pandemic. And the, upper and the respiratory outbreaks are definitely going up. Quickly, going to show you a bit of UK research. Don't worry about all these figures. That's just me showing off that I can do a bit of statistics. <laughs> so if we believe this study, this is one of the studies that UK Public Health did, if they vaccinate the kids in an area, the risk of anyone attending a hospital having flu is that, and that's called numbers needed to treat. So to reduce the risk of one person attending a hospital in an area where kids have been vaccinated, you have to vaccinate 6,193.6 children so that one person the risk of them getting flu has been reduced. Okay. Now there's other stats which are a bit better than that, but I think that's a very interesting one. So let's map that out so you understand it. So for that one person there not to attend hospital with flu, then bear in mind that one in 10 kids will get an influenza-like illness from the vaccine. That means you've got to make all those children ill. So 619 children have to be made ill so that one person doesn't get the flu. That's probably got something to do with why the respiratory outbreaks are going up in the schools. That's not counting the secondary infections and all the rest of it. <clears throat> There's another one. This was South Korea. Mandatory vaccination for chickenpox, for crying out loud. 2005. 2006, it was only 22.6 cases per 100,000. Look at it. Jumped straight up to 71.6 cases in a matter of years. And of course, you've got polio. I won't completely go through this. Have you heard about this? I talked about it before. They eradicated polio in India, and they looked around, and there was 50,000, there's more than that now, 50,000 kids with polio. And they said, well, we've eradicated it. 
They said, I know, we'll call it something different. So they called it non-polio acute flaccid paralysis. But it's twice as deadly. And this, I can't get into this, they've been doing that for years. Okay, so we're not happy with that. <coughs> now, if you don't get childhood infections, other things, like there's a risk of Parkinson's disease was associated with the lack of those, okay? And also what they found was that if you have a negative history of measles, and also that's also linked to maybe a negative history of catching normal flu before the pandemic, you are more susceptible. So you need to be getting these basic infections. Yeah, so I would suggest from this that if you're getting the, the yearly flu shot, that is really not a good idea, okay? Because when a pandemic comes down, you are vulnerable. So is it a perfect storm? We've seen already from the data from the CDC and some very clever scientists that during the pandemic, it wasn't the flu that killed them. It was this colonizing of bacteria the flu had allowed to happen. We've seen this is being mimicked in the vaccines that have been given to the kids at school at the moment. And other people can argue about it. I'm quite happy for that. And when you vaccinate um, for, for pneumonia, you select for other strains or you weaponize other strains. And if you give a seasonal flu vaccine, you weaken the immune system. Does this, all, does this look like a plan to keep people healthy? So what happens is you get an increase in flu and other viral infections and pneumonia, which we've just demonstrated. And what they're actually saying in this paper is, look, we understand, Mr. Gates and other people, that you're interested in the flu. That's fine, but have a look at this. We think it could be something else as well that's, called, that's really the risk. And what they're saying is, you need to really stock up on antibiotics. But there's only one problem with antibiotics, isn't there? You all know what's wrong with antibiotics? They're all running out. They're saying, look, Antimicrobial resistance and serotypes in streptococcus pneumonia have been evolving with the widespread use of antibiotics and the introduction of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. So they're saying the, by giving the vaccines, we're actually causing a problem. And they're actually saying it. And they're saying these areas, it's more pronounced. And this multi-drug uh, resistance become a serious concern. And they're saying, look, after you vaccinate, after you vaccinate, look, another one pops up. And that's becoming um, problematic with, with, with treatment. A more recent study. What they're saying is you need to be judicious. You should not be just handing out antibiotics like the sweets. And this really, all this says, is that really you need to get infected naturally. And when you do, you have a wide protection against infection and, gets, and also against um, pandemics. And if you're not, if you don't have natural infection, then you, that's a problem. Who, this, remember this one from the first talk I did? Who saw the very first talk I did here? Anyone? She's the chief medical officer, and she wrote this book. Yeah? And in this book, she was warning about antibiotics. She wrote this story, and I'm just going to... I don't know if I can read it off of here. And she, this, now, this is the chief medical officer. Look at this. She had a, this was her little story. So this was her imagining the future. This is quite a few years ago now. She said, look, a few years later, shortly after Josh joined the primary school, the government passed new laws, making it a criminal offence for the infected to be in public. There were talks of random tests in the street. And if you were contagious, you will be committed to one of the isolation sanatoriums that were being built on the edge of all major towns. This was a death penalty. They were referred to as the colonies. You know, I, find, I still find that disturbing all these years. That's a chief medical officer. So do they know something we don't? And there's another guy warning us about this flu. So we've got, they're all going at it. So the question is, if I can see that data, <coughs> excuse me, if I can see that data, why can't they? Is there a conflict of interest? Is there pressure? I know other people have got a narr another narrative for this. Well, this is UK data again. This is, I'm not going to name this guy. He's not put himself up as a public figure. He's just one of the scientists. This is Dr. X. Okay. <laughs> now, this is one of the UK studies. Now, he declares lecture fees and travel grants from a drug company. Well, he works for Public Health England. Now, this may be he didn't receive a lot of money, maybe, or maybe that's just the way it's done. But do you not think that the scientists that are working for Public Health England should be absolutely separate from the drug companies? Do you not think that's, that should happen? 
Another one, Dr. Y, declares no direct interest. However, University of Surrey, which he's part of, is involved with something called Flucop and something else. Now, he works for the Royal College of General Practitioners and Surrey. What's Flucop? This is Flucop. It's just it's drug companies. Look at all the people that are in this. All the universities and all the drug companies, all side by side, funding and working with each other. University of Oxford, University of Surrey. So you see lovely studies come out. See, these, these drugs are amazing. I'm not suggesting they're lying, but I think it's very hard to bite the hand of someone that's feeding you. You know, I really do. This is the company that makes this particular vaccine that goes up your kid's nose and causes that bacteria to increase in the nose. Well, they, they're part of AstraZeneca. And AstraZeneca is part of that flu cop. And this is this whole lovely little thing where they all work together. Now, this is Dr. X, who's on that thing. <laughs> Sounds really mysterious, Dr. X. I had a look into him and his expense reports. Now, he's been funded by three drug companies to work at Porton Down. Now, I've no idea. Now, public health have got a lab there, apparently. I'm, I was under the impression that was for biological weapons. I could be wrong. It's a matter of public record. I'm not saying anything. I just found that interesting. So, Mr. Gates, we're a bit vulnerable right now. And if something that spread very quickly, like, say, the flu, that would be quite fatal. That would be a tragedy. A tragedy. Because we've got to break down those organisational barriers. Now, is it the Ides of March? Is he a bogeyman? Or is it a perfect storm? I'm going to stick with a perfect storm, although I know others would have a different thing. And there's the Spanish flu, and here's the next pandemic that he's threatening is going to happen. So there's an increase in H1N1 infection. We are getting increased infections and also being susceptible, susceptible to H1N1. We've got an increase in bacterial colonization, which just before the flu. We're, we, we're creating that in the children now. And we had the pandemic, and who knows when that one's going to come. I'm more than happy for someone to shoot this down. But I think, at the very least, the questions need to be asked. Because from what I'm seeing, they're not making it better, but they are absolutely making it a lot worse. Now, let's have a watch him again. An epidemic, either naturally caused or intentionally caused, is the most likely thing to cause, say, 10 million excess death caused. It's the most likely thing to cause, say, 10 million excess death. I would beg to differ on that, Mr. Gates. Now, the, it was interesting, I was talking to Spence, and he said, oh, fear porn, don't do fear porn, you've got to give solutions. There you go, it's built in. That's the website, I'm always, always, and Ian will tell you, and I say this, I'm always, why don't you do this? Why don't you have a book? Why don't you put something on? I'm always getting asked. So, if you go to that, there was a course on there, that course is about 16 lessons on it, and it shows you how we deal with these problems without using drugs. I'm going to say support the body to deal with infection, okay? I'm not going to say cure or treat. And I have had many, 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 many people who have been very, very ill. Very ill. Um, and they've gone all through the antibiotics and it's not worked. And we've used good old natural medicine. And it's helped them within days. Now, the course was an original course for, for doctors over a weekend. We slimmed it down and um, you could learn it in a day very easily. The normal price, which you will not pay, is 120 quid, okay? If you put in AV8, you will get a pass for it for 30 quid, okay? I would strongly advise you do something, and if you, this stuff has been extremely successful for me with many, many, many patients. Now, normally we give a two-week pass to the people who go on it. If you guys go on it, you'll get at least two months, okay? But you need to put AV8, and it will say, and you'll press the button, okay? You don't want me to answer any questions, do you? Where's Ian? You can do a workshop on Monday. I'm, I'm going to do a workshop on Monday, okay. So that, Matt, is there any possibility on the next one I could have a bigger screen so I could see it or not? Speaking on the, uh... Actually here, so I can actually read? Because I'm going to need to read something. Is that okay? So we're going to have five minutes. No questions. Any questions, please ask me afterwards. And um, we're going to get through this. I'm going to be at the bar later. So the way to my heart is a cup of coffee. Uh, so we have about a million people with a cup of coffee.